If it's comfortable for you, I'd like to invite you to stand. And if you'll repeat after me, with God, all things are possible. Together? With God, all things are possible. Now, if you'll turn to somebody near you and speak to them with all the faith that you can find within. And just say that again. With God, all things are possible. And now again, find another person. With God, all things are possible. And one more. With God, all things are possible. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. And you can be seated if you're comfortable. Yeah. So we are continuing a series today. And it's called The Keys to the Kingdom. It's all about living the abundant life. And David Owen Ritz says that there are seven keys to the abundant life, keys to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And uh, you'll remember that we, we started off week number one, and we spoke about the first key, which was commitment. And that com key is all about the commitment to put God first in your life, in all areas of your life, your time, your talent, your treasure, to put God first. Commitment was the first key we talked about. And then key number two was vision. And some of you are still working to write your vision. It takes time to write your vision, but there is great power to writing your vision down. I know that for years you've got this idea moving around in your head, but when you put it on, on paper, in words, it takes on greater power to manifest, greater power to create. And so you're invited in this series that we are doing to dream big and to commit your dream into words on paper as a visionary statement for your life. So key number two was vision. And then last week, we spoke about key number three. And key number three is truth. Truth with a capital T. Truth as in the, the, the spiritual teachings, the spiritual truths which undergird our abundant life. The spiritual truths that are like laws in our life. And as we understand those truths and we, as we live from those and put them into practice in our life, then we live the abundant life. Because here's the thing. We all have small, what I call small thoughts. We all have thoughts that we don't really want to create. They're worry thoughts, they're fear thoughts, they're anxiety thoughts. But when you focus on the truths with a capital T, those are a higher thought. And they will replace those small thoughts. They have greater power and energy than those small thoughts. So we talked last week about focusing on the truth. Now throughout this entire series, the real focus is on learning to put God first in every area of our lives. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. So we're to seek God first. Put God first, seek God first. Put God first, seek God first. Would you say that with me? Put God first, seek God first. Yeah. So today we're going to speak a little bit about key number four which has to do with all the things that get in the way of our living the abundant life. Key number four is letting go of the past. Letting go of the past. I mean, the past is over and done with, right? Yeah, it's over and done with, but guess what? We still carry it with us. We still carry it with us in the form of resentments and judgments and condemnations and guilt. We carry that with us so that the past isn't really over. The event may be over, but we relive it in our own hearts. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like carrying a sack of potatoes. Now, now, have you ever kept a sack of potatoes in your pantry a little bit too long? <laughs> ah, yeah. I wish you could see your faces. <laughs> You know what it's like. So if you keep that sack of potatoes a little too long, the first thing that happens is, is they start to grow these little tendrils, right? Which are roots. And then what's the next thing that happens? They start to, oh, they get moldy. Yes, they get moldy and they start to smell. I mean, if you've ever walked into your house at the end of a day when there's a, there's a rotten potato somewhere, you know it, right? Your nose goes right to it. Although I told the folks in the first service that unfortunately I'm the only one that has a real nose in my family. My husband can't smell anything. So I'm the one that discovers all the odors. Um, anyway, so, 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 so what does sack of potatoes have to do with anything here? Well, well here's the thing. 
We carry the past with us like this heavy sack of potatoes, this 10 or 20 pound heavy weight that we're carrying on our shoulders. And the longer we carry these potatoes of these old experiences, they begin to sprout these roots that, that just constrict our heart. It's like the roots just reach around and hold onto us and constrict our ability to receive good in the world. And if we hold on this sack of potatoes too long, our life starts to stink, right? I mean, literally, it starts to stink, doesn't it? Because we don't even realize it. it, it, it it's a funny thing. It becomes sort of um, insidious. We don't realize that we're lugging this pack of, sack of potatoes. We've been doing it for so long. We don't even realize it. But things in our life aren't expressing the way we want them to express. We're not living the abundant life because we're carrying around this old stuff with us. And so the answer to that is, of course, forgiveness. We're here today to talk about forgiveness. There, I've said it, the F word right here in church. <laughs> forgiveness. <laughs> One of the things that um, David Owen Ritz says, and I always like to give credit because David Owen Ritz is the creator of this program called Keys to the Kingdom. And one of the things he says about this dragging our past with us is that our problems have a way of repeating themselves. Have you ever noticed that? That your problems have a way of repeating yourself? That's one sure sign that there may be some forgiveness work to do. He says, he says that it's kind of like your problem goes home, changes clothes, and comes back with all of its friends. You know? You ever had that feeling like, I've been here before. When am I going to get it? When am I going to get this thing? Well, that's because we, never, we sometimes don't leave the past behind us. Um, David Owen Ritz says that the past isn't really the past. This part of the past that is still alive is very much our present at a different level. And, hear this, and will be our future unless we release it. That smelly, stinky, grabby sack of potatoes is going to be ours until we throw it in the trash bin. And the way to do that is with forgiveness. Now, David Owen Ritz says forgiveness is simply letting something go. It's letting it go. He says it's not pretending something didn't happen. It's not excusing or condoning the behavior. It's also not conditional. It doesn't require that the other person say they're sorry or for you to even say you're sorry to them. It doesn't require it. Forgiveness is letting it go. It's just taking that sack of potatoes and getting rid of it. But we all know that it's not, well, it's not as easy as all of that. Now, some of you might be out there thinking, oh, here's another lesson on forgiveness. You know, I really, my life is in good shape. I'm pretty content. I'm pretty happy. I don't have anything to forgive. You know, I had that big one last year. I took care of that, and I am done. I got nothing left to forgive. And that may be mostly true for you. But here's what I want you to know about forgiveness. The need for forgiveness creeps up on us in small ways. It's not just the big stuff that you might be thinking of. It's also the little things. It's, it's, it's the person who cuts you off in traffic. It's the person who didn't close the door uh, when they left the building. It's, it's, it's the person that you say you've forgiven, and yet when you hear something has kind of gone wrong for them, you take this insidious joy in hearing that. <laughs> I know nobody in this room would, would ever do that, but... I was at a concert on Thursday night. I went to see Crosby, Stills, Nash. And um, we got there early, and I struck up a conversation with this woman next to me. We just, you know, we were just chatting up a storm, having a good old time. And, and uh, she started to tell me about uh, her, her job, which, from which she had been laid off, after the boss had come to her and begged her to come to work for him. And then, you know, a few years passed, and she was laid off. And, and, um, and then she began to say, but he got his. <laughs> And she told me what had happened to him. And he, he got kicked out or something of the company too. And, um, but then she, she owned it. She said, I just don't have forgiveness in my heart yet. Yeah. So you see, there's all manners of judgments, resentments, unforgivenesses, condemnations that we carry along with us. 
And the question is, how do we let those go? How do we let those go? And, and I realize that as we come together here today, that there are all manner of things that you might be carrying with you that you'd like to release and let go. All manner of things. And some of these are, are wounds and hurts that you did not deserve in any way at all. But here's what I want you to know. You're the one carrying that sack of potatoes. And so the opportunity today is to ask yourself, to ask your heart, how can I let? How can I let this wound go? So that I can experience the life of abundance, right? So that you can experience the life of abundance. Yeah, Alan Cohen wrote a book called A Deep Breath of Life. And in it, he tells a story of an attorney named Michael Rembold. He's still a practicing attorney. And Rembold was dealing with a particularly difficult divorce situation. And there had been attempts made for the couple to make amends, and they'd not been able to make amends. They'd not been able to settle out of court. And so on the day that Michael was getting ready to go meet this couple in court, he took some time for prayer. And he was a student of A Course in Miracles, and something came to him. And what came to him from A Course in Miracles was this teaching. Forgiveness offers me everything I want. Forgiveness offers me everything I want. And that came into his mind, so as he went into prayer, he began to pray and send forgiveness thoughts to the couple. And then that felt so good that he began to send forgiveness thoughts to the opposing attorney. And then he began to send forgiveness thoughts to the judge and to all the people who would be in the courtroom on that particular day. He finished his prayer time, and later on that day, he went into the court. But when he got there, there was no one there. So he went to find the judge, and the judge said, didn't your secretary call you and tell you? The couple settled out of court. Well, that was wonderful news. You know, the attorney said, that's amazing. And the judge said, well, it's not nearly as amazing as the fact that I had 32 cases scheduled on the docket today, and they've all settled out of court. <laughs> Cohen goes on to say, there is nothing in this world that cannot be healed by forgiveness. There is nothing in this world that cannot be healed by forgiveness. I cannot tell you the number of people who have come into my office for counseling or prayer. And, and they come in presenting with one particular issue, whatever it might be. But as we sit together, we come to realize that underneath it is a forgiveness issue, an opportunity to forgive. And if they'll take that step toward forgiveness, this other issue will dissolve away. Anytime you or I hold a judgment toward another person or to ourselves, we are cutting off that natural flow of God. Because we are, cutting some, we are cutting part of God out of our lives. We're cutting that person out of our life. Or worse, we're judging ourselves and saying that we're not worthy of God's love. Anytime there's an unforgiveness. And it's not about, it's not about whether or not you were harmed. You were harmed. If there's a forgiveness issue, you were hurt in some way. And some of you have been hurt in ways I couldn't begin to imagine. And yet the invitation is always there to move into forgiveness. The horrific incident that happened in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, where a shooter entered the temple while the Sikhs were worshiping. And... and, and set fire or began to shoot the people that were there, opened fire. How do you forgive that? I was reading a write-up on the event and on a prayer vigil that happened afterwards. And I'm reading these words now. Some at the vigil were struck by the Sikh community's willingness to forgive the man who committed murder in their temple, who was himself shot dead by the police and to emphasize peace over vengeance. The town's police chief, John Edwards, was among them. And here's what John Edwards had to say. He said, in 28 years of law enforcement, I've seen a lot of hate. 
I've seen a lot of revenge. I've seen a lot of anger. What I saw particularly from the Sikh community this week was compassion, concern, and support. He told the vigil standing in front of a row of people holding signs that spelled out, practice peace. What I didn't see was hate. I did not see revenge. I didn't see any of that. And in law enforcement, that's unusual to not see that reaction to something like this. He said, I want you all to understand how unique that is. And so the, a core teaching of the Sikh faith is forgiveness. A core teaching of Christianity is forgiveness. Jesus' core teachings, love and forgiveness, love and forgiveness, over and over and over, love and forgiveness. That was the message, right? That's what Jesus stood in and taught over and over and over again. And so how is it that we're going to step into this forgiveness? How do you and I, when we've been hurt, or how do you and I, when we know that we've betrayed someone, and we are so judgmental of ourselves. How do we find a place of self-forgiveness? The Course in Miracles says that when forgiveness happens, it's a miracle. And there's no order of magnitude in miracles. Whether you're forgiving the person who cut you off in traffic, or whether you're forgiving this shooter in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. There's no order of magnitude to those miracles. Every forgiveness heals not just you and the others involved, but it is a holy instant of God connection, and it heals the world. Now, I have my own theory about how it is that hurts happen. And I believe that if we just had enough self-love, the hurts wouldn't happen. I believe that if I had enough self-love for myself, that I wouldn't take offense at the things that happened to me. And if the other person had enough self-love, they wouldn't have committed whatever offense it is that was perpetrated on me. You know, there, I heard a story about a therapist who was once speaking to hundreds of people in a big auditorium like this. And somebody asked her, they said, when you counsel with a couple, what do you see? And she said, okay. She said, I'd like to ask some volunteers to come forward. She asked for seven men and seven women to come forward. And here's how she set them up. She said, here's what I see. And she put the two partners, partner A, partner B. And then behind partner B was a mom and a dad. And behind the mom was a mom and a dad. And behind the dad was a mom and a dad. And over here where partner B was, there was a mom and a dad. And a mom and a dad behind the mom. And a mom and a dad behind the, the, the dad. And she said, that's what I see. When someone comes into my office, I see all of that. And here's what you and I know, is that everybody's loving the best they know how. But most of these people didn't know how to love themselves enough. Most of us don't know how to love ourselves enough. It's, we're works in progress. But I am convinced that when you and I get that, when we get to the place that we love ourselves enough, then things will happen and we won't even engage because we know that we're enough. You see, the other piece about how it is that, that hurt happens, of Course in Miracles says that, that a person in any moment is either coming from, from fear or from love. So often, when we hurt someone, we're coming from fear. Fear that there's not enough. There's not enough love for me. There's not enough God for me. There's not enough good for me. And so I hurt you. Or you hurt someone else. It comes from fear. Or fear or forgetting. Just flat forgetting that God is here. God is in us. And that, th that enough love will heal anything. We forget these things. We're coming from fear or from love. And when we come from fear, then we hurt. We hurt ourselves and we hurt others. And so the first step of forgiveness, first of all, is to, is to begin the process of self-love, to sit in your own silent time and to allow yourself to pray to God, to reveal to you just how amazing you are, that you are love, that you are loved beyond what you could ever know. There is so much love for you. There is so much love for you in this world, more than you could ever, ever know. 
And so you begin to open up to that possibility. And as you do, you start ripping those roots out of your heart. You start ripping those old roots out of your heart. And as you do, you begin to know that you can see this other person who may have done something very horrendous. As a child of God that had all these people behind him who couldn't love themselves, let alone this person. And it begins to soften your heart. It doesn't, it doesn't excuse it. It just begins to make it in its own way shapeshift. And you move into the holy instant of God connection and forgiveness. It really all comes down, I think, to self-love. And to realizing that there's enough love in you to love yourself and to forgive yourself and enough love in you to love and forgive the other person. I want to share another story from A Deep Breath of Life by Alan Cohen. It's a book of daily readings and each reading has a powerful story or insight. And the particular day I'm reading from is entitled, Then I Saw the Picture. And this story, this story speaks to a soldier's dilemma. You know, our soldiers are devoted to our country. And they're doing what they're called to do in service for this country of ours. And yet they're faced with such difficult decisions. This particular soldier had just killed one of the enemy, which was his duty to do that. And yet, in this particular circumstance, he followed protocol as he was always called to do. And the protocol was to go through the possessions of the soldier to see if there was anything of, of value there. And in this particular case, what he found, it shook him. It stopped him in his tracks. In this soldier's jacket was a photo of his wife and young child. Suddenly I realized I'd killed a real person with a family like my own. And this soldier made the decision that he had to make. He realized he could not do it anymore and he asked to be transferred out. And here was what Cohen says of this circumstance. He says, we keep enemies by not looking at them. The moment we look into the eyes or the heart of one we call enemy, we recognize ourselves. If there's someone from whom you feel estranged, he writes, look in their eyes. If you can do this in person, you will see their innocence behind the drama and feel your oneness with them. If it's not possible to do this with them physically, call them to you in spirit and mentally look into their eyes. When you touch someone's soul, you cannot long hold resentment. The eyes are the windows of the soul, but they are also the mirrors of yourself. We keep enemies by not looking at them. When I think about, when I think about the times that I have betrayed others, the really big betrayals in my life, it's an effort to find compassion for myself. But when I do find that compassion, I realized, you know, if I had loved myself enough, I would never have put myself in that circumstance. And when I think about the times that others have hurt me in a really deep and serious way, what I know is that if they had loved themselves enough, they would not have done what they did. And if I loved myself, and if I had enough boundaries to not get in that situation. You see, I don't know how we're going to forgive the man in Oak Creek. 
I pray that we do. I know some can't understand that, but I pray that we do find a place of forgiveness. And I pray that you and I find a place of forgiveness in our own hearts for the things that we have done. And that we find a place of forgiveness for those who have hurt us, for those who have hurt you. Because we don't need to drag that sack of potatoes around anymore. Love is the greatest power in this universe. Love is the greatest power in this universe. And when we call upon enough love, then the miracle happens. Forgiveness happens. Whatever's in your heart today, whatever you want to let go, I invite you to lay it down. To lay it down. seem bigger than you can imagine. I know the hurt may be deeper, so deep you're not even sure you're ready to let go of it yet. But I invite you to know that the power of God's love is greater even than the hurt. And in this moment, right now, the possibility of forgiveness exists.